नमस्कार दिस इज फर्स्ट पोस्ट एंड यू वॉचिंग वैंटेज विद मी पलकी शर्मा China is getting busy in Bangladesh they're cozying up to the new political masters in Dhaka their former tormentor Pakistan is also reaching out Shehbaz Sharif wants to bury the bad blood what does all of this mean for India's position in Bangladesh how can new delhi retain its influence we'll discuss all of this meanwhile prime minister modi is on a foreign visit his destination is an oil rich muslim kingdom in southeast asia it is not in the gulf it is brunei in southeast asia back here in india IIT placements have plummeted but the brand IIT remains alluring abroad. Defying an ICC arrest warrant, President Russian President Vladimir Putin has landed in Mongolia. In West Bengal a new anti-rape law has been introduced but beyond the politics will the bill change anything? In Kashmir separatists have joined the electoral race. Pope Francis is on a historic 12-day Asia Pacific tour. What does he hope to achieve? Why do Indians have difficulty claiming health insurance? Volkswagen could close its plants in Germany. It's a first, we'll tell you why. And looks like climate change is claiming a new victim. It's kimchi. All this and more coming up. The headlines first. Russia targets the central Ukrainian city of Poltava. Two ballistic missiles strike a military education facility and a nearby hospital. Dozens of people killed and nearly 200 injured. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky orders a probe. This is one of the deadliest strikes since the Ukraine war began in 2022. Lebanon arrests its former central bank governor, Riyad Salemi, is accused of embezzling more than 40 million dollars from the bank. Last year he left the post. that he had held for 30 years the former bank governor is seen as a key culprit in lebanon's dramatic economic crash he is also wanted by france for alleged financial crimes an attempted jail break in the democratic republic of congo leaves more than 100 people dead at least 50 people have been injured the prison has a capacity to hold 1500 inmates but it houses around 15000 the overcrowded prison is the largest one in the central african nation Cathay Pacific grounds its entire Airbus A350 fleet and cancels dozens of flights. The Hong Kong carrier said it was to conduct an inspection. This comes after the airline detected engine issues on one of its flights. Cathay is one of the largest operators worldwide of the A350 jets. And the biggest ever environmental crime case in Sweden gets underway. A waste management company is in the dock. It is accused of dumping around 200,000 tons of toxic waste illegally. The trial is expected to last till May next year. Big changes are happening in Dhaka. Enemies are becoming friends, rivals are becoming partners, and old friends are becoming foes. It's a major churn after Sheikh Hasina's ouster. And who is benefiting from it? Looks like everyone but India. The US, China, Pakistan, they're all making inroads while New Delhi is dealing with baseless accusations, even hostility in some quarters. Let's start with China. Their ambassador in to Dhaka has been quite busy. A few days ago, he met caretaker leader Mohammad Yunus. He also invited him to visit China. Now this is normal diplomatic protocol. Even the Indian envoy met Yunus. But the Chinese ambassador went a step ahead. First he met the BNP leadership. The BNP is the Bangladesh Nationalist Party. It is one of the biggest parties in Bangladesh. They were the arch rivals of Sheikh Hasina. Later the Chinese ambassador also visited the Jamaat-e-Islami office in Dhaka and this is very significant the Jamaat was accused of war crimes in 2010 since then no foreign official had visited their office so China is the first in 14 years the ambassador held talks with the Jamaat chief he called them a well organized group Jamaat-e-Islami use we used to have a uh, two relations 
with the Chinese Communist Party, with our embassy. <clears throat> but it has been affected during the last 13 years. But now we believe it's time to re-establish our close ties and restart our dialogue and cooperation. Interesting way to describe a radical Islamist group. But then again, this is China. If they can embrace the Taliban, Jamaat should not be a problem. Same with the BNP. Xi Jinping had traveled to Dhaka in 2016. Sheikh Hasina was in power back then, but Xi Jinping also met her chief rival, BNP leader Khalid Azia. So Beijing's strategy has always been clear. Keep your options open, cozy up to anyone who's in power. Which brings us to their iron brother, Pakistan. Pakistan is also courting the new powers in Dhaka. The BNP and Jamaat have old ties with Islamabad. Their new target is Mohammed Yunus. Pakistan's Prime Minister Shehbaz Sharif spoke to Yunus over the weekend. He talked about strengthening bilateral ties. Sharif also referred to the historical bond between Dhaka and Islamabad, which is frankly strange because Pakistan slaughtered Bengalis in 1971. It's not the sort of history you fondly remember in a phone call. But then again, this is the new Dhaka. We've seen Sheikh Mujibur Rahman's statues vandalized, his family home destroyed, and liberation museums targeted. So clearly, Pakistan is not taboo anymore. And this is exactly what Islamabad wanted, a reset with Dhaka. They've announced a new decision. Bangladeshis can now visit Pakistan without paying the visa fee. You would still need a visa, but you wouldn't have to pay for it. The United States is also making moves, but not overtly. Mohammed Yunus will be visiting the U.S. this month. He is expected to address the United Nations General Assembly. A couple of things to note here. This will be Yunus's first trip abroad after taking office. Not India, not China. He is visiting the United States of America. And we get the idea behind it. The world is confused about where Bangladesh is headed. So the UNGA, the United Nations General Assembly, is a chance for Yunus to clear the air. Just one problem, though. Yunus is a caretaker. His job is to oversee this tense period, to hold democratic elections. Plus, the law and order situation is not back to normal yet. So should Mohammed Yunus really be jetting off to New York? It's a question to consider. Here's another one. Where is India in all of this? Well, New Delhi is keeping an open mind. Yesterday, the Indian High Commissioner met the Interim Home Minister of Bangladesh. They discussed a number of important issues like the security situation in Bangladesh, the safety of Indian nationals, and the exchange of flood warnings. And that last one, the exchange of flood warnings, is very important after the recent flood. Many Bangladeshis wrongly blamed India for causing the flood. But beyond these exchanges, what is the status between India and Bangladesh? Well, Sheikh Hasina remains a problem. She now has 89 cases against her, most of them for murder, 89 cases. So Hasina's stay in India is a clear point of contention. The second issue is the political past. The BNP and Jamaat have historically been anti-India. On paper, they claim to have changed. Both groups have talked about strengthening ties with New Delhi. But if they come to power, who knows? It's a delicate situation for India. New Delhi has shown some flexibility recently. For example, Indian officials have, have held multiple rounds of talks with the Taliban. That too was considered impossible at one point. But it's happening. Same with the Maldives. Mohammed Muizu talked about India out. He expelled Indian soldiers from the country, yet New Delhi kept engaging. It invited Muizu for Prime Minister Modi swearing in. So India has demonstrated diplomatic flexibility. No reason it cannot be, re be replicated in Dhaka. Of course, the rest is up to them. India will have some red lines for the regime in Bangladesh. If they respect those red lines, ties may stabilize. If not, all bets are off. Prime Minister Modi is visiting Brunei. It's a trip that's easy to overlook. Brunei does not stand out like some of the other engagements on India's diplomatic calendar.
Later this month, the Prime Minister will be in New York to attend the UN General Assembly. Next month, he'll visit Russia again, this time for the BRICS summit. Compared to these, a visit to Brunei seems less significant. But for India's diplomatic efforts in the region, this visit is extremely important. This year, India and Brunei are celebrating 40 years of diplomatic ties, four decades. But never before had an Indian leader set foot on its soil. Modi is the first Indian Prime Minister to visit Brunei. When he arrived today, he received the full red carpet treatment. He was welcomed by the Crown Prince of Brunei. Brunei is a unique country. It is a tiny tropical nation in Southeast Asia, home to less than half a million people, most of whom are Muslims. Brunei is on the island of Borneo. The country is split into two parts, separated by Malaysia. That's right. There's a piece of Malaysia between the two halves of Brunei. During the 15th and 16th centuries, Brunei was a powerful sultanate. It controlled large parts of the Borneo Islands, also some parts of the Philippines. But over a period of time, the empire whittled away. By the 19th century, Brunei was struck by conflicts and piracy. In 1888, it became a British protectorate. What does that mean? What's a British protectorate? Brunei Sultan was still in charge, but he had no control over foreign affairs and defence. These were controlled by London. But despite Britain's protection, Brunei kept losing land. The British controlled it for almost 100 years. Finally, in 1984, they were ousted. And since then, the Sultan of Brunei has been in charge, Sultan Hassan al Bolkiah. He's still on the throne. He's one of the world's oldest, longest reigning monarchs. And he is the one who invited Prime Minister Modi to visit Brunei. And this is where the two leaders will meet the Istana Nurul Iman Palace. It is the official residence of the Sultan and one of the world's largest residential palaces in the world. Listen to this. It has over 1,700 rooms, parking space for more than 100 cars, five swimming pools, a mosque that can accommodate 1,500 worshippers. There are 44 staircases inside. They're made up of 38 different types of marble. Such opulence, it should tell you something about Brunei. It's a small country, but it's very rich. In fact, it's one of the richest in the world. Citizens earn more than $77,000 a year. That's the average, $77,000 a year. And they don't have to pay income tax. They also have to spend less on staples, food, water, health care, even housing. The, sa the state subsidizes all of this. And citizens don't have to spend on education at all. The state provides it for free. But what makes Brunei so wealthy? It's oil and gas reserves. The government gets 76% of its revenue from energy exports and India is among Brunei's top customers. The energy trade is a key foundation of this relationship. In 2022, the bilateral trade reached $400 million. A bulk of this was from India's energy purchases. And this is a good starting point for both sides to build their relationship on. Defence is another priority and on this front, Brunei could use India's help. Let's look at the map again. Brunei is right next to the South China Sea. It is one of the six players in the region. It has claims conflicting with Beijing. Brunei's coastline faces the South China Sea. It has access to important trade routes and potentially lucrative oil and gas reserves. They have access to all of this. But Brunei faces a challenge from China. Beijing stakes claim on almost the entire South China Sea. Do you know how much oil and gas this region has? 190 trillion cubic feet of natural gas and 11 billion barrels of oil. This could be worth more than a trillion dollars. China wants to grab this entire reserve, which is why Chinese forces are so aggressive in this region. So Brunei needs help to defend its interests. And it is looking to India for support. Both countries want to boost defense ties. They plan to create a joint working group it will focus on deepening bilateral cooperation in defence. 
There are other areas of interest, including space, technology, health, trade and investment, and people-to-people -people exchanges. All of it is on the table. Brunei is also a member of the ASEAN. So by courting this tiny, oil-rich nation, India could secure another ally in the region. And Prime Minister Modi's visit could open a new chapter in this partnership. Our next story is also about India's outreach, although of a different kind. This is India's outreach in the field of education. But first, a quick backstory. Shortly after India gained independence, it was confronted with a weakness. The nascent republic lacked higher educational institutes, especially for the sciences. So as, a as the country started to find its feet, the Indian Institutes of Technology, or the IITs, were set up. The first was IIT Kharagpur in the state of West Bengal. Then you had IIT Bombay, Madras and so on. These were set up as institutes of excellence to train the very best and to overcome India's initial shortage of engineers. Today we have 23 IITs all over India. And now one of them has opened a campus in the United Arab Emirates, UAE. IIT Delhi Abu Dhabi is officially open for business. It was inaugurated yesterday by Sheikh Khalid bin Mohammed Al Nayan, the Crown Prince of Abu Dhabi. He's the eldest son of MBZ. MBZ is Mohammed bin Zayed Al Nayan, the President of the UAE. Sheikh Khalid was seen touring the campus. He also welcomed the first batch of undergraduate students. There are 52 in total, a mix of Indian, Emirati, and international students. They are pursuing B.Tech degrees in computer science and engineering. Now, this inauguration is a major milestone. It's the second foreign IIT campus to be inaugurated. The first was an IIT Madras campus in Tanzania. It was inaugurated last year. It's been conducting classes since last October. And now we have the IIT Delhi campus in Abu Dhabi. These mark the first steps in the spread of IIT education abroad. And we say it's about time. Think about it from a marketing perspective. The IITs have always had a reputation for excellence, a brand value, a certain pedigree, and this reputation has stood the test of time, no matter the recent turbulence, which is also something that we've discussed on the show, on the challenges that the IITs face in the tough job market and how the graduates are not getting placed for top dollars. That is a challenge. But despite all of this, the IITs remain coveted institutes, both in India and outside. For years, we've, we've been sending our engineers to the world especially IIT grads. They've made a name for themselves in Silicon Valley and added to the reputation of these institutes. So why not leverage this reputation? Why not use the IITs as a means to boost India's soft power? New Delhi realized this opportunity a few years ago. They embarked on this mission in 2022. A committee of the IITs shortlisted some countries, countries where they would set up IIT campuses. The initial list had seven nations. You can see that the UAE was always a priority, but as things turned out, Tanzania ended up becoming the first destination and Abu Dhabi the second. The third could be a lot closer in Sri Lanka. If the plan materializes, it would be the second overseas campus for IIT Madras. So the internationalization of India's education is truly underway. That's how the country's education minister put it. The internationalization of India's education. And this phrase is a bit nostalgic. Long ago, India was famous for its education. You had the grand universities in Nalanda and Takshila, renowned for their teachings. People would come from all over the world to study at Odantapuri or at the Somapura Maha Mahavihara in what is now Bangladesh. These monasteries and universities made Indian education famous and made teachers from India highly sought after. The oldest school of Tibetan Buddhism is credited to an Indian guru, Padma Sambhava, also known as Guru Rinpoche. He is thought to have built the first monastery in Tibet. By comparison, the first IITs overseas, the first IIT overseas campuses are a drop in the ocean. But they are a step in the right direction, helping India reclaim its legacy of bringing knowledge to the world. On Monday, Vladimir Putin landed in Mongolia. The Russian president got a grand welcome. The capital was decked up for him. In any other year, this would be just another neighborhood visit. But this one was under global scrutiny. That's because Mongolia is a member of the ICC, that's the International Criminal Court. 
Last March, this court issued an international arrest warrant for Putin, a warrant for war crimes. Now, Mongolia, as we said, is a member of the court, so technically Mongolia must arrest Putin. But they haven't. Instead, they're rolling out the red carpet for him. Can Mongolia ignore the ICC warrant? Will it face repercussions? Has any world leader been arrested on an ICC warrant? Our next report tells you. This is the Genghis Khan Square, decked in Russian and Mongolian flags. The red carpet is ready. Soldiers are lined in horsebacks. Live bands play the martial anthems. All prepared to welcome a special guest, Russian President Vladimir Putin. It's his first visit to Mongolia in five years. And Putin got quite the lavish welcome. There was a guard of honor at the airport and then again in the capital. He met his Mongolian counterpart, Ukhagi Khulelsuk. The two leaders held talks, they promised cooperation, and then there's a gala reception. The relations with Mongolia are among the priorities of our foreign policy in Asia. They have been brought to a high level of comprehensive strategic partnership. So it's quite the vibrant, friendly visit for Putin. Except there's a problem. Mongolia is a member of the International Criminal Court. In March 2023, the ICC issued a warrant. It was for the arrest of Putin. The court said he was responsible for war crimes. So that put Mongolia in a bind. ICC members are expected to arrest suspects who have a warrant issued for them. ICC is an international organization. It is true that we are a member country, but it doesn't mean we have to follow every order and arresting Putin during this visit is immoral and improper. China and Russia both are very important to us as neighbors. During the Soviet era, Mongolia was under Moscow's sway. Since 1991, the two shared friendly relations. Mongolia did not condemn the Ukraine war. It declined to vote on it at the UN. Plus, it relies on Russia for oil and gas. The focus of this visit by Putin is also on a pipeline, one that will carry gas from the Yamal region to China via Mongolia. It is not just about transit of the Russian gas through Mongolia. We are reviewing the possibility to supply this energy source to the Mongolian consumers. Gazprom is ready to provide the support in the practical issues of the country's gasification. But the question is, why isn't Mongolia worried? They are flouting an ICC arrest warrant. Aren't there any repercussions? Mongolia is a state party to the ICC Rome Statute. That means it must cooperate with the court, which also means it must arrest Putin. Yet it didn't. Now the ICC can take measures it deems fit against the country. Yet there's no clarity on what these measures are, which makes the ICC here a toothless tiger. Putin's arrest warrant came 18 months ago. He's never visited an ICC member state since then. But with this trip, he's proven one thing. The warrant was just plain tokenism. The Hague-based court can't enforce it. Neither can the member states. It depends completely on the will of the country he's visiting. And for Ulaanbaatar, it doesn't matter. On one side, they have a non-enforceable arrest warrant. On the other, they have an ally that will bring them investment. And we all know who Mongolia chose.
India is talking about women's safety because of two major events last month. In Kolkata, a female doctor was raped and murdered in a hospital. In Kerala, a judicial probe exposed extortion in the film industry. This triggered anger and protest, so political leaders wanted to be seen as doing something. In West Bengal, they're pushing a new bill, the Aparajita Bill. It was passed by the State Assembly today. Chief Minister Mamata Banerjee called it historic. She even demanded the resignation of Prime Minister Modi and Home Minister Amit Shah, saying they had failed to protect women. That is why they must resign. So the politics is heating up, but let's take a look at the bill first. It's called an anti-rape bill that gives the death penalty for rape, with two exceptions, two conditions rather. If the assault results in the victim's death, or if it leaves her in a vegetative state, then the death penalty applies. That is the first and the most important provision of this bill. Number two, the limit for investigations. Probes into rape cases must be concluded in 21 days. The current limit is two months. Extensions may be allowed, but only under senior supervision. Provision number three, fast track courts. The law calls for the establishment of special courts for speedier justice. Number four, penalties for delaying justice. And this is for everyone, from police officers to health workers, to anyone who fails to act promptly, they will all be penalized. But the bill is not without its problems. It restricts publication of court proceedings in such cases. You need permission of it to report on the court proceedings. And if it is published without authorization, you can be penalized. Now the state says this is to protect the dignity of the victim. But what it also does is prevent the media from holding the government accountable. Now the Bengal Assembly has passed the bill. It will head to the governor and then the president. And if the president gives her assent, it will become the law. But will the law change anything? We ask because India already has anti-rape laws. They've existed for years. Rape is a non-bailable offense in the country. The punishment ranges anywhere between 10 years to life imprisonment, in some cases even the death penalty. So do we really need another law? The state says we do. They want to plug loopholes in existing laws. They want to enforce stricter punishment. But this approach may not help. It hasn't helped. And I'm not the one saying this. The Indian Supreme Court is. Harsher anti-rape laws alone do not deter crimes against women. I'll give you an example. In 2012, there were 2,44,000 cases of crime against women. These were the reported cases, 2,44,000, 2012. That's the year the Nirbhaya rape rocked the nation. So in 2013, India's anti-rape law was amended. It became stricter. But crimes against women only went up. In 2023, the number of recorded cases was 4,45,000. That's around 51 FIRs every hour. So India did introduce stricter laws, but that has not brought the crime rate down. Because this is a systemic problem. Laws alone cannot fix it. Take, take the, state for Kerala, uh, the state of Kerala, for example. A Me Too movement is rocking their film industry. A new judicial report highlights abuse and exploitation. It implicates top actors, filmmakers have been charged, politicians have been named, more than two dozen cases have been filed. The state of Maharashtra, which is home to Bollywood, has now taken note. Apparently, they want a similar investigation into Bollywood. I'm sure it will expose more dirt. And such investigations must be conducted. But they must be seen to their logical conclusion as well. And I'm afraid that does not happen. We have a recent example in the Me Too movement, the one that started in 2018 in Bollywood with Tanushri Datta. She accused actor Nana Patekar of touching her inappropriately. Two other people corroborated her version and that opened the floodgates. There were accusations in every industry, Bollywood, government, even the media, practically everywhere. Hundreds of people were accused. Top figures were implicated. Many lost their jobs. Yet six years later, little has changed. Look at Tanushri Datta's case. The police took her complaint, but one year later, they closed the case, citing insufficient evidence. That's what happened in most of the cases, in fact. As for the men, after lying low for a few months, they got back their jobs. They were reinstated. And they're back to doing what they did. No repercussions, no judgment. Because public memory is short-lived. Once it's out of the news cycles, no one cares. When Me Too hit the headlines, there was a push for change. But when it got to boring legislation, the public focus shifted. And the accused made a comeback. Most of them charted a redemption arc for themselves. And who ended up paying the price? The women. 
We are a society that forgives and forgets easily, so change will take a lot more than stricter laws. Yes, we need deterrence, but we also need more accountability. We need more empathy with the survivors to amplify their voices, to hold the men accountable and not rest until justice is served or else all this outrage will remain a mere footnote in this story. We are counting down to elections in Jammu and Kashmir. It promises to be a very important one, the first since 2014, also the first since Article 370 was revoked. 370 is what gives a special status to Jammu and Kashmir. It was scrapped in 2019, so Kashmir lost its special status. And later this month, it will see elections. This time, new players will be on the ballot. Well, not technically new in the game or on the scene, but new on the ballot. These are old and controversial players in Jammu and Kashmir politics. I'm talking about the separatists. A number of them will be contesting the election, both as independents and as members of regional parties. The election will be held in three phases. September 18th, September 25th and October 1st. 90 MLAs will be elected to the Jammu and Kashmir Assembly. Among the hopefuls are separatists. I'll give you some example. Javed Hubi is contesting from Charare Sharif. He is the son of a former Hurriyat leader. A quick side note, the Hurriyat is basically a political alliance in Kashmir. It is made up of 26 political parties. They want Kashmir to secede from India, to separate from India. A second example is Aga Muntazir Mehdi. Again, the son of a Hurriyat leader. He is contesting from the PDP, for the PDP from Badgaon. The PDP is the People's Democratic Party. It is a regional player in Kashmir. A third example is Altaf Ahmad Bhatt. His brother is in jail right now. He was very close to the Hurriyat chief, Syed Gilani. A fourth example is Kalimullah. He's contesting as an independent. He is backed by the jamaat e islami Now, the Jamaat has been banned by the central government, so its candidates are independents. Reports say they will field up to 14 of them, 14 Jamaat candidates. And these are just some of the examples. Many more separatist candidates are in the fray this time. And why is this important? Because Kashmiri separatists have always boycotted elections. They rejected Indian democracy. Instead, they wanted to leave the Indian Union. So from the 1990s, separatists boycotted elections. But this time, they're contesting. What has changed? Well, the security situation has improved. Most of the separatist leaders, the senior leaders, were arrested in 2019. So the movement is not what it used to be. Plus, separatists have tasted electoral success. It happened in the recent general election. Engineer Rashid won the Baramullah seat. He defeated two heavyweights of Kashmiri politics, former Chief Minister Omar Abdullah and People's Conference leader Sajad Lohan. What's more, Rashid is in jail. He was one of the separatists arrested in the 2019 crackdown and he won the election from jail. And that has given confidence to other separatists. They too are joining the electoral race. Regional parties in Kashmir have welcomed this move, especially the PDP and the National Conference. The NC or the National Conference has always asked separatists to join the democratic process. So they're claiming vindication. Election. हमने सामना किया इन लोगों ने बॉयकॉट के नारे दिए थे अब खुद इलेक्शन के मैदान में उतरने के लिए तैयार हैं तो कहीं ना कहीं इनकी आइडियोलॉजी में चेंज आ चुकी है और हमारी बात सही साबित हुई 
And what about the BJP? Well, they too have welcomed this move. The party says the credit goes to the central government. Why is that? Because removing Article 370 gave separatists a chance to contest. On paper, this is not bad at all. Any strategic expert will tell you that this is not bad. It's always good when separatists join the democratic process. Disagreements may still exist, but at least they have joined the mainstream. Just consider engineer Rashid. He took oath as an MP in July this year as a member of parliament. An oath that includes allegiance to the Indian constitution. So separatists contesting elections is not bad per se. The question is, what happens afterwards? What will they do with this newfound power and legitimacy? Again, consider Rashid's party, the Awami Ittehad party. They are fielding around 36 candidates in Kashmir this time. 36. They may not win that many seats, but they can emerge as kingmakers. That's a possibility, perhaps part of a ruling coalition even. If that happens, separatists could find a seat at the high table. They could influence policy decisions in Kashmir, decisions that could impact security. Of course, they would still be bound by the Indian constitution. But it's still uncharted territory. Like I said, this promises to be a very important election. We'll be tracking all the updates for you. Now let's turn our attention to Pope Francis. He's currently on a historic tour in Asia. A 12-day trip that started today with Indonesia. Indonesia, which is home to the world's largest Muslim population. Next, the Pope will visit Papua New Guinea, Timor-Leste and Singapore. Of these four island nations, only one is predominantly Catholic, Timor-Leste. So on the face of it, his choice of tour stops is unusual. Which brings us to the question, what is he trying to achieve in these islands? What is the Pope doing in Asia? Our next report tells you. He's 87 years old. He's on a wheelchair. He's battling a spate of health issues. And currently, he's on a historic tour in Asia. This is Pope Francis. And he's in Jakarta, the capital of Indonesia. He was welcomed with tears and cheers as he kicked off the longest and farthest trip of his pontificate. I am very proud and touched because we are in a Muslim country and are still visited by the Pope, the highest Catholic leader. I am hopeful that with the blessing of the Pope, Indonesia can become a better country in the future. During the 12-day trip, the Pope will visit four island nations, Indonesia, Papua New Guinea, Timor-Leste and Singapore. Of these four nations, only one is predominantly Catholic. So why is the pontiff on this tour? There are two reasons. First, the significant shift within the Catholic Church. We're talking about the tilt to Asia. The Church is no longer a Western institution. Churches in Africa, Latin America and especially Asia have a growing influence. Asia is one of the few places in the world where the Catholic Church is growing. Be it through baptisms or religious vocations. Even though Catholics remain a minority, they are promoting dialogue with other religions, running schools and charitable works. The Pope has previously visited a number of Asian countries and he's been increasing his engagements with the region. So now, a tour to the Asian island nations makes complete sense for the Pope. Plus, this extends his outreach to what he calls the peripheries, meaning communities who are either marginalized or far away. And this is the second reason why the Pope has selectively chosen locations for his tour. What about the themes of this landmark visit? They've been carefully picked as well, including interreligious dialogue and protection of the environment. The agenda is tailor-made for each nation. 
let's look at Indonesia. This is the world's most populous Muslim-majority country. In a population of about 283 million, 87% of the people are Muslim. But Indonesia has a decent Christian population as well, of about 3%. The Catholic community here is considered lively and a shining example of interfaith tolerance, despite Islamic extremism in the country. Here, the Pope is holding talks with religious leaders at the Istiklal Mosque, the largest in Southeast Asia. He will sign an interfaith declaration, hold mass for 70,000 people, and meet with outgoing President Joko Widodo. Indonesia and the Vatican have a similar commitment to cultivate peace and brotherhood as well as ensure prosperity for the people. Next, the Pope will visit Papua New Guinea, one of the world's poorest countries. He will travel to remote cities and meet with missionaries, many of whom have walked for days from all over the country to meet the Pope. Next on the tour will be Timor-Leste, Asia's newest nation, when 97% of the population identifies as Catholic. And finally, Pope Francis will wrap up his trip in Singapore, the economic powerhouse. Known for its blend of ethnicities and religions. So it's quite the mix. And the Catholic Church can only hope that the Pope's grueling tour bears fruit. Our next story is for anyone who has tried to buy insurance, especially health insurance. Why do people buy insurance? Mostly for their peace of mind to protect themselves against unexpected life events. But ask anyone who has tried to buy an insurance policy. They most likely tell you that it's a dreadful experience. You have to navigate confusing jargon in policy documents, hustle and endure a maze of fitness tests and haggle with agents over every penny. The entire experience is stressful to say the least. And to make matters worse, many Indians are struggling with their health insurance claims. Earlier this year, a survey came out. 39,000 Indians took part in it. They were asked about their health insurance and if they had trouble with their claims. 39,000 Indians. 43% of them said they did, that their claims were either rejected or partially approved. And this even forced some patients to stay in hospital longer than was necessary. So what issues did these policyholders face? Well, there is a whole list. Lack of full disclosure about exclusions and ambiguity in contracts. Some claims were rejected due to pre-existing diseases, others over eligibility issues. So policyholders want more transparency from insurance companies. That's what more than 90% of the respondents said in the survey. They want a more transparent process. And these complaints are not new. The government of India is aware and it has raised similar concerns in the past. Last year, they released an assessment. The government released an assessment. It focused on cases in consumer courts. The government looked into some 600,000 cases, some 6 lakh cases from the consumer court. Nearly one third of these were related to insurance companies. That's well over 1,60,000 cases. Most of them were about health and life insurance. And the issues were the same. Vague insurance contracts, refusal to cover pre-existing diseases, and lack of transparency by insurance intermediaries. The government also believes that insurance policies need to be more transparent. And they should be worded simply. India's insurance regulator has been looking into this, that's the IRDAI, the Insurance Regulatory and Development Authority of India. This year, it made some changes in regulation. The first was about cashless claims. Health insurers need to clear cashless claims in three hours now. Companies were asked to offer more choices to make it easier for senior citizens to get insurance too. They often find it hard to get insurance, mainly due to their age and due to pre-existing medical conditions. Companies do not like to insure the elderly. If they do, they charge exorbitant premiums. So these moves by the regulator must be welcome. They're good moves, but they may not be enough. And I'll tell you why. 
73% of Indians do not have any health insurance, 73% of the country. There is clearly room for growth. The industry is pushing the government. They want health insurance to become more accessible. Recently, the industry made a demand, lower the tax on insurance premiums. The GST applies here too, the goods and services tax. Right now it is 18%. So you pay an 18% GST on your insurance premium, an 18% tax. The industry wants it to be brought down to 5%. Reports say the government is considering this proposal. If implemented, insurance policies would become more affordable. And that should help. But again, we say, what's the point of getting an insurance if you cannot claim it during a crisis? If you are squeezed for premiums every year, but when you file a claim, you are turned away. In this day and age, health insurance is a necessity. But without strong regulation, customers will remain targets for exploitation. Our next story is about Volkswagen, the German automobile giant. Most of you will be familiar with the company or its host of subsidiaries like Audi, Porsche and Škoda. All these brands are part of the Volkswagen Group, making it both a German and European institution. But this grand company is currently in a world of hurt. And yesterday it did the unthinkable. The CEO announced that he wants to close some car plants plants in Germany. And this is unprecedented. It has never happened before in the group's 87 year long history. In fact, Volkswagen has not closed a plant since 1988, since it shut a facility in the US state of Pennsylvania. That was in 1988. So what has prompted this turn of events? Why is Volkswagen closing or thinking of closing down its factories and that too in Germany? Well, it's a combination of factors which have merged into the perfect storm. The biggest reason is the rise of Chinese electric vehicles, EVs. As you know, EVs are everywhere these days. The electric craze started with Tesla, but soon the industry came under Chinese dominance with brands such as BYD, NIO, SAIC Motors and the, and the rest. The Chinese EVs are everywhere these days and that has hurt Volkswagen in two ways. One was the Chinese market. Before the rise of these EV giants, China used to be Volkswagen's single biggest market. But then BYD and others started growing and Volkswagen's share of the Chinese market started shrinking. Profits dipped, growth stagnated, Volkswagen's share prices started tanking. It was chaos. But this was just the first blow. The second was the growth of Chinese brands in Europe. The EV craze has hit every part of the world and Europe is no different. Electric cars and hybrid sales keep growing. They make up 25% of all European car sales. They made up 25% of all European car sales last year. This would have been challenging enough for Volkswagen, having to transition from petrol and diesel to EVs. But then came the Chinese brands. They clawed their way into the European market and they keep growing taking away the share of traditional European auto giants like Volkswagen. So it's a double blow. Volkswagen is losing both China and Europe to the Chinese brands because of the new electric vehicle craze. Now you would think Volkswagen should do better. It should get with the program and start churning out EVs. Well, it did. And that has become another problem for them. Volkswagen and its arsenal of subsidiaries all invested in EVs. It was a tough market, already dominated by early movers like Tesla and the Chinese companies. But the Europeans knew that EVs were the future, so they went ahead and it has been tough. They cannot produce their cars as cheaply. They have to pay European wages after all. So European EVs are more expensive, more expensive than their Chinese counterparts. And this is a price sensitive segment, often subject to price wars between Tesla and the Chinese firms. So the Europeans kept ending up as collateral damage. To counter this, some of these European companies like Volkswagen decided to make in China to bypass the European wage problem. So they invested in Chinese plants and began manufacturing in China. But then came another blow, European tariffs on EVs from China. The EU, the European Union, is putting tariffs up to 38% on EVs made in China. Any cars made in China will face this tax of up to 38%. And this includes cars made by European brands like Volkswagen.
So it seems that no matter what they did, they could not win. Now combine all of this with the bigger picture, the state of the European economy. Europe has been struggling for years now. First, there was the Wuhan virus pandemic, then the Russia-Ukraine war. Both have hammered the European economy. Growth has stagnated. Germany, in particular, is in the doldrums. It keeps hovering around a recession. Every month seems worse than the last. And Germany is supposed to be Europe's growth engine. If the engine is busted, how will the economy run? How will people make money? How will they afford cars? So it's no surprise that European car sales are down overall. Volkswagen was already dealing with sluggish demand at home, and now the whole EV debacle. It has been one blow after another, and the German giants are finally throwing in the towel. They want to shut plants at home and lay off workers, something they had promised to not do till at least 2029. But now they want to break that promise because the situation is just that bad. Volkswagen is in a race against time. It has to cut about $11 billion in costs, $11 billion in the next two years. That is its grand plan to survive the transition to EVs. So expect more potential closures and layoffs. These are just the first casualties of the rise of the EV age. Now let's talk about climate change. It has claimed yet another victim, South Korea's national dish, kimchi. Kimchi is a fiery fermented food. It is mainly made of Napa cabbage. But now the crop is at risk due to rising temperatures. Experts fear that by 2090, 2090, South Korea will not be able to grow the crop at all. And kimchi, as we know it, will change forever. But this is not an isolated case. From poutine in Canada, to gallo pinto in Costa Rica, to sushi in Japan, to aloo paratha in India, across the world, climate change is putting traditional dishes to test. Here is a report. When South Korea launched its first astronaut to space in 2008, do you know what they sent with her? Kimchi. This is a fiery fermented food made of mainly Napa cabbage. Kimchi originated over 3,000 years ago. The tradition started as a way to store vegetables during the cold winter months. Today, kimchi can be found complementing nearly every meal eaten in the country. It's South Korea's national dish and it is an integral part of the Korean identity. But that may not be the case for long because kimchi is under threat. It has fallen victim to climate change. Napa cabbage thrives in cooler climates. It's usually grown in highland areas. But with soaring temperatures, unseasonal rainfall and growing soil diseases, both the quality and quantity of the crop is taking a hit. And farmers are running out of area to grow the crop. The area of highland cabbage farmed last year was less than half of what it was 20 years ago. It's very sad to think that we might not be able to make kimchi, which our ancestors have eaten for generations, using cabbage grown on our own land. If this continues, then in the summertime we might have to give up cabbage kimchi. Scientists are looking for ways to save kimchi. We are looking into watering methods that could help lower temperatures and expanding the use of biological control methods to combat the newly emerging crop diseases. Given the rising temperatures, we are also working on developing cabbage varieties that can grow well even in higher temperatures. South Korea needs feasible solutions and it needs them now. If matters don't improve, experts calculate that by 2090, no cabbage will be grown in the highlands. But South Korea is hardly the only one worrying about its traditional foods. Across the world, climate change is causing farming conditions to change. So crops that were once suited to certain climates may now need to be grown elsewhere. Plus, rampant floods, wildfires and droughts are destroying crops. Rising temperatures in the oceans are either killing sea life or pushing seafood out of their traditional range, putting many traditional delicacies at risk. Like the Canadian traditional dish, poutine. 
This is a combination of potato fries, cheese curds and gravy. All these ingredients are produced at home. But thanks to warming temperatures, Canada's potatoes are shrinking in size. Potato produce is decreasing. Cows are increasingly dying of heat stress and cheese production has reduced. Or look at China's vastly loved Peking duck dish. China is the world's largest domestic duck producer. But heat stress is increasing the risk of disease, causing more ducks to die. In short, you can choose any country and most traditional dishes, like Costa Rica's gallo pinto, Italy's pasta, Japan's sushi, Jamaica's aki and salt fish, or India's alu paratha. And you will see that flavors and the quality of food are changing. More crops are dying and the area of production is taking a hit. So no matter where you are, climate change is taking a bite out of culinary classics. And if we don't act fast, forget the future of traditional dishes, it will be difficult to put food on the table. Have you ever seen a tiger trap? It's less of a trap and more of a cage, easily big enough for humans too. How do we know? Because a forest official in Uttar Pradesh decided to get inside. He got trapped inside it. It's the ultimate comedy of errors. Locals in Lakhimpur Kheri in Uttar Pradesh have been complaining of wild animal attacks, especially tigers and wolves. So the big guns rolled in. The forest department arrived with a tiger cage, but the locals had a question. How does the cage work? One of the rangers decided to give a demonstration. He went inside, locked the gate, but couldn't get it to open again. Apparently, the lock was jammed. The ranger had to spend around an hour inside the cage. Eventually, they did manage to open the lock, but by then, the damage was done. Internet had seen enough for some big laughs. Now it's time for Vantage Shots, images that tell the story. Police fire tear gas during clashes with protesters in Bolivia. Egypt's international air show kicks off, aiming to transform the aviation sector. And pollution and heat wave leave Belgrade's rivers covered in a thick layer of green algae. Finally, we're taking you back in history. On this day in 1971, Qatar became independent from Britain. The Ottoman Empire had occupied Qatar by the 1870s, but during the First World War, it became a British protectorate. This arrangement continued until Britain decided to leave the Gulf. After talks with the UAE in Bahrain, Qatar declared independence in 1971. We're leaving you on that note. Thank you for watching. We'll see you tomorrow. Con ese tipo de arma, esa arma de Pac-Man, ¿cómo se conoce? Se está...
Across continents, one powerful news source. Bringing you diverse perspectives on the issues that matter. We go beyond the boundaries to give you that little extra about every sporting moment. So thank you for making First Post 5 million strong. We're counting on your support and you can trust us to bring you the news unfiltered and unvarnished. Climate change is on our doorstep. It's time for a revolution to take root. And it starts with 1.4 billion Indians. It starts with one tree. One tree for humanity. One tree for Mother Earth. One tree for our future. Project One Tree, a News 18 Network initiative.